Hey there, so I want to try to do a little refresher on our death with Christ. Paul says in uh, Philippians 3, you know, we pursue to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and it being conformed to his death. And I used to think that that meant some sort of mystical experience, being conformed to his death. And I thought it meant like subduing myself or uh, I, I didn't really know what it meant, but I knew I felt like I couldn't do it, you know, but I wanted to, but I couldn't figure out how. And I want to say that being conformed to the death of Christ is not a mystical experience. It is a reckoning. When Paul talks about our death with Christ, the first time you see him talking about it in Romans 6, he, it's all about knowing and reckoning. Knowing that you have been baptized into the death of Christ and reckoning yourself dead to sin and alive unto God. A reckoning is an accounting. And it is basically an obedience to the truth revealed in the word and saying, Amen, yes, it's true. I died to sin, and I am alive to God. I reckon that to be true. Um, you know, some people say, oh no, you need to yield to the Holy Spirit. Well, Paul talks about yielding to the Holy Spirit, but he says that we are to yield our members to God as instruments of righteousness because we are alive from the dead. So again, it's based on a reckoning. It's based on an agreement with God's word, which is his testimony concerning Christ and what he accomplished in Christ. And the uh, two big things he accomplished in the death of Christ for us were one, the forgiving of our sins through the shedding of his blood and presenting it before him on the mercy seat, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us and answering all the accusations and vindicating God's righteousness in passing over our sins and forgiving us. But then also, we died with Christ. As the last Adam, he put to death the human race in God's reckoning. And uh, Paul says, we were as many as were baptized into him were baptized into his death. We've been baptized into the death of Christ. And that's something that God did and judges to be true whether you feel like you've experienced or not. Just like you need to believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is the answer for your sins, whether you feel it or not. And that's the only answer you have for condemnation in the Christian life, by the way, is believing God's record concerning his son and the blood he shed. Well, there's another thing to set of things we believe, we learn about and uh, learn to agree with and believe and reckon to be true and that's what believing is is it is reckoning God's word what he said to be true and that is that we died with Christ we were buried with him in baptism into his death and we were raised with him and now we are dead to a number of things and are alive to God. And the life is in our spirit and the death has to do with our flesh. And the flesh is the old man, Adam. And Christ, according to Romans 5, is the last Adam. No, it's 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the last Adam. That's one of his titles. As the last Adam, he's the end of the Adamic human race and he is its condemnation and its judgment. He's been given authority to execute judgment on all flesh, and he did it at the cross. He terminated. He put an end to the fallen, degraded, corrupted humanity. And this is something we're supposed to learn to reckon on. So again, being conformed to his death is not a mystical experience. It is in a growth, I believe, in an appreciation of the truth and its implications. And uh, I've taught about this a lot on my channel. You know, we know we're forgiven of our sins, and we struggle to even believe that. We have to exercise our faith 
to believe that and practice believing it and say no to the devil, say no to the accusation, say no to the sin and say yes, I can come boldly to the throne of grace based on the blood of Jesus and God, I, I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ and he's forgiven all my sins and if I sin I have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous who himself is the propitiation of my sins, right? I can come near and that takes a while to grow to learn to practice. One of the reasons we struggle to practice that, though, is because we don't also understand that we were dead with Christ. And being dead with Christ, on the one hand, puts our past out of God's view. Okay, But we think in terms of negative. We think God's wanting to put the negative things out of his view. But the cross deals with the positive. And that's why Paul mentions the offense of the cross in Galatians 5. It is a, it is a offense because it judges the flesh. And the flesh is not just the bad things I did yesterday, but the good things. It judges everything as being unprofitable. It judges the old creation as having no place in God's program. What is God's answer for what I am? See, God's answer for what I did is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how he can forgive me and deal with me. But how does he deal with what I am? After you grow in the Christian life, you start to learn that the problem isn't just what I did, it's what I am. And what I am is going to cause me to do even more. The more I live, the more the worse it's going to be, you know. Well, the way God deals with what you did is the blood, but the way God deals with what you are is the cross, and he's already done it. He crucified you. He judged you. And we need to accept God's judgment, and we don't because we think we're good, okay? So the way some people have one part of the cross teaching right. They go, well, I died to sin. So how... They'll say, you know, how can I continue in sin if I died to it? I'm going to stop sinning because I died to sin. But they don't realize that they're only reckoning themselves partially dead. They think they're dead to sin but alive to the law and alive to God's expectations and God's demands. And what we learn in Romans 7, which is after Romans 6, is not only do we die to sin in the body of Christ's death, but we died to the law in the body of Christ, that we may be joined to another. And Paul says in Galatians 2, I through the law died to the law. I've been crucified with Christ. Now what is the law? The law is the good that I would and should do. The sin is the bad things I did do. The law represents the good that I would do. The good that I agree with, okay? I have to see that in God's reckoning, I'm dead to the law as well. What does that mean? It means that the law no longer places a demand on me. See, a lot of people say, okay, you've been forgiven. You died to sin and now you're a new creation in Christ and you're forgiven. So now you need to be a disciple and you need to get about your father's business. No, what you need to do is recognize the significance of your of baptism into the death of Christ which is an end of all God's expectation on your flesh it, it is his judgment on the flesh issued back at the flood when he said man is just flesh his, only, his imaginations of his heart is only continual, uh, continually evil I will no longer strive with him and I, his days are 120 years, he decided to destroy mankind at the flood. He said he repented and then he made him, but Noah found grace. And since Noah, God has been working to generate the new creation, which was created in the death and resurrection of Christ. And now in the death and resurrection of Christ, God is working on something new, which is not Adam, but Christ. Christ is the end of the law to those who believe, and he's the last Adam. He's not just the end of the law, he's the end of me. And the new creation is the new man, which has Christ as the head, Christ as the life, Christ as the reality to all the members of his body. 
who are the new creation. We've been joined to him and there's a new life, a new person that we're to learn to live. And we don't know how to do that at all and the flesh doesn't help at all. The flesh does not help you live Christ. The flesh can't understand the things of the spirit, their foolishness to him. The flesh is it carnal. The, it, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The mind of the flesh is carnal and hostile to God. Can't be subject to him. We have to learn to agree with these things. These are the judgments that God has put in the scriptures. And the end of the law is the cross. Some people say, well, Romans 3 says, uh, do we make void the law through faith? No, we establish it. Well, what he's saying, that's the beginning of what he's saying. And he says, he's saying the same thing all the way until he gets to Romans 7, which is, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I agree with the law of God in my mind that it is good, but I see another law warring in my members, the law of sin, which works in me all matter of covetousness when the law comes and says, you shall not covet. And I find this other principle in me that when I would do evil, a good, evil is present in me so that the things that I would do, I don't do. And the things that I hate, I do. I'm a slave to sin. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? That is the end of the law. That is the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to work that kind of realization. It was given to bring you to frustration. It was given to expose the fallen condition of the flesh for self-righteous man who doesn't think he needs condemnation. He doesn't think he's condemned. He thinks he's pretty good. He can do it. He can do God's will, you know. Just show me what to do and I'll do that. No, you don't understand. I have judged you ruined. And if you don't believe me, look at the last Adam on the cross. That is what I've decided for the flesh. And the only way to be at peace with God is to learn to accept his judgments. You know, some people, they never get free from condemnation no matter how much they exercise faith in the blood because they still expect that part of them should be good. But Romans 3 says there's none good, none righteous, no, not even one. Not even one. That's the judgment of the law. The law condemns us all and shuts every mouth. And a person who learns how to reckon themselves dead learns to stop expecting good from themselves. The reckoning of the cross is a, just a realistic agreement that what God has said in his word about my flesh is true. There's nothing good dwell in it. You may not believe that today, but in 10 years you will if you honestly persist in trying to do the will of God. Now, if you deceive yourself and think you're doing the will of God when really you're just deceiving yourself and you don't tremble at the word and the law doesn't, can, you don't have any kind of condemnation, you've got a seared conscience, you may never reach that, uh, you know, but the law does its work as a schoolmaster for those who are being led to faith. And what it does is it shows you your need for Christ. And that's really what we say when we go into baptism is, I am dead. I've been crucified. A lot of people think baptism is a statement of commitment to God, but it's not. It is an identification with Christ in his death and his judgment on the flesh. And it's a liberation. It feels like condemnation. You're willing to accept condemnation. And we see, we want to accept forgiveness, but we don't want to accept condemnation. But we're forgiven because we were condemned. We were condemned and forgiven. And we have to judge the way God does. We don't. We say, some of my sins, my sins have been forgiven, but I have not been judged. As if our sin is something different than us in our past. As if there's something good about us apart from our sin. No, we are we are polluted with sin and corrupted by it. And every imagination of our heart apart from God is evil continually. Even our thoughts about God, especially our religious service. There's nothing more wicked than unenlightened, zealous flesh trying to serve God in religion. Those are the most horrible people I've ever met. I can, I'd much rather sit at a bar. I used to not be like that. Uh, 
but I didn't understand what religious flesh was. Religious flesh is flesh that wants forgiveness and wants the things of God, but doesn't accept his judgments. So it's a much more hard-hearted stance than someone who just isn't sure if they believe in God. This is someone who deals with his word and deals with the things of God regularly, but does not accept God's judgment. That is a stiff-necked rebellion, which is as the sin of witchcraft. Jezebel thrives in environments where people will not reckon their flesh dead and are enemies of the cross. What does it mean to be an enemy of the cross? It means I give my flesh a pass and say, yes, it can serve God, and I treasure my virtue, and I treasure my history, and I treasure all the different experiences I have, and I boast in them, and I prop myself up in my flesh, and I want you to glory in it too. But the person who's beginning to see that they died with Christ has been exhausted of all expectations on themselves and they finally realize God is no longer expecting anything of me. I'm in the tomb. And I've said it before, the only person allowed to move in that tomb is Christ. If somebody moves, it better be Christ in resurrection. Everything else in there is dead. And that's what we are. We are learning to wait on Christ. To work in us that which is pleasing in his sight. We're not trying to handle ourselves and do it ourselves. See, the reckoning of the cross helps you, helps you interpret everything. It really does. Once you start seeing everything in the light of the cross, it, ch it changes your theology, brings you close to God, helps you drop things that are not necessary. It really does. And also, people can't take advantage of you anymore. That's why it's also we are crucified to the world. Paul said, God, God forbid that I glory except in the cross of Christ through whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. And he was talking about his reputation and religion. We want their approval because we want God's approval and we think it's the same thing as long as we're working for the wage. You know, the uncrucified man automatically tries to work for mammon, tries to work for the wage, tries to put God in his debt. But you can't. If you try to put God in your debt, you will find that you are condemned. And so there's a wage system that's crucified. There is a wage system in the Bible. If you do X, Y, Z, you will have X, Y, Z. But the thing is, God knows that when you try to do it, you're not going to do it. And if you don't do it perfectly, you don't get X, Y, Z. You get ABC, and ABC is judgment. If you try to serve him under a wage system and put him in your debt, you will find yourself judged. So that scripture, Jesus said, uh, whoever falls upon this rock will be broken, but whoever this rock falls upon will be utterly smitten and are into pieces, destroyed. You want to fall on the rock and be broken. We all have to deal with the rock, which is Christ and the cross. It's a stumbling block. And you're either going to be broken on it or it's going to totally destroy you. And we want to be broken on that rock. We want to say, yes, Lord, I, I agree. And, and the first, you know, when Paul talks about serving God and yielding to him, you're, you can't do it without reckoning that you're dead and alive to him. And you're supposed to present yourself as a living sacrifice, which means you're on the altar. You're not allowed to move. And the, the, the sacrifice is offered in the holiest where the Shekinah glory is, and that's where the Spirit works, and we're waiting on the Spirit. And you know what? You shouldn't go out and seek to serve God if you don't know what that means. You know, there's a lot of people who should be quietly hiding in the holiest, waiting on the Lord to show them spiritual reality and spiritual truth and who the Spirit is and how He works before they go out and try to serve Him in their flesh. He will make you a totally different person so that when you speak, it's a flow of the Spirit. It's rivers of living water. And it actually serves people. I used to just have Bible knowledge. You know, if somebody was talking about Nephilim, I could get in there and talk about Nephilim better. If they were talking about Ezekiel 38, I could jump in and talk about Ezekiel 38 even better. Daniel 7, I'll tell you. Daniel 9, I'll tell you. Daniel 9, you know, 70th week prophecy, I'll break it down. 178th 
3,800 or 330 days till the Sheikh Nagid, and it's exactly this day. I knew the whole thing. And you know what? It didn't profit anybody. It was just a bunch of Bible facts. But now everything I talk about is related to Christ and his death and my death with him and the spirit. And that took many years of waiting on the Lord. And and I'm not saying it's in any kind of accomplishment. It was all in failure and an embarrassment. But there's a lot of people speaking who have no idea what we're talking about. And honestly, they don't know what they're talking about. And now they've become opposers of the truth and enemies of the cross. They're vocal about it. You know, the normal Christian, I, like today I dropped my kid off at VBS at a church that we used to go to. And I'm just looking at him. I'm like, these people are so sweet. And they are they are serving God in a simple way uh, to the best of their knowledge. They don't know much. But I, I know that they're believers, you know. They are not like these zealots that get on YouTube and decide they have a ministry and think they're, think they're going to start serving God and haven't learned anything in the secret place, have nothing, no knowledge of the Spirit, and so they're just in drama continually and offended continually, taking their channels down and bringing their channels up and launching attacks at people, personal attacks, and going to war and saying, it's on, and... You know, I mean, it's just a circus. Uh, but that's because it's uncrucified flesh. What is crucified flesh? Is it more spiritual flesh? No, it is It is a person who believes God's judgment about themselves and accepts it. That brings a humility and a brokenness and a yieldedness that allows you to start seeing new things in Christ. Gets the attention off you and your performance and on to Christ where it belongs. And I'm sorry, but if you don't know the cross and you have not accepted the judgment of God on your flesh, then you don't know anything about grace. There is no true grace ministry outside the crucified Christ and bearing his cross and preaching Christ and him crucified and what that means and how, what the significance for that is. And, and it ends up you end up taking the burdens off of yourself and everybody. You know, discipleship, well, here's what I say, here's what Jesus says about discipleship. If you have an army of 10,000 and there's a king coming at you with an army of 20,000, then you you count the cost. You don't go out to war. You wave the white flag and you ser- look for terms of peace. And he said, "Likewise, If you don't forsake everything you have, you can't be my disciple. What do you have? 10,000. What is that? Your strength. That's what he's getting at. You've got to see that discipleship is coming at you like a demand, like a king. And it's in opposition to you. And you're judged and you're conquered and you're defeated. And you, before... Before he even says, be my disciple, you're defeated and judged. You're not his disciple. What are you going to do? You can't match him. You can't be anything like Jesus. You're nothing like him. What are you going to do? Wave the white flag. Look for terms of peace. See, the grace person who is able to accept the judgment of God on his flesh also learns the terms of peace. What are the terms of peace? Christ is my peace. He is my righteousness. I find out he is my discipleship. He is my sanctification. I find out there's a new meaning of the word discipleship in resurrection. It's called abide in me and I in you. You're a branch in the vine. You've been grafted into him and now his life is in you. And you're just to delight in his word and let his word remain in you. And do not be moved away from the word which he's given you. Do not be moved away from the promise of eternal life. Abide in him. Only a grace person is going to come to that conclusion. A person who has not judged their flesh is going to still be trying to figure out how to be a disciple. They're going to read discipleship books, and they're going to teach everybody to try to keep the law. Because they don't see they died to it. They don't see how repugnant their flesh is to God. They don't see that God's judged on the cross. They're enemies of the cross. You can be a believer and enemies of the cross. Paul said, I warn you even weeping, that many walk 
as enemies of the cross. And I see it, you know. It's people who will not accept the judgment of God on their flesh from the word. They, and they won't reckon it to be true. And not only that, but they oppose the message. And that's really what a legalist is. A legalist is a person who thinks he still has something to offer to God and believes even though his sins have been forgiven, he wasn't judged. You know, the thief that made it in, you know, to heaven, the, who said, Lord, remember me, be, uh, and he said, this day you'll be in with me in paradise, remember when you come in your kingdom. He told that other guy that was mocking him, hey, we deserve to be here. That's what the judgment is. Do you see that you deserve to be on the cross? Most of us don't because we live superficially, cosmetically cleaned up lives. But the lepers and the prostitutes and the unclean and the tax collectors and the sinners that followed Jesus all had one thing in common. Their sins had gotten so big and so out of control and so marred their life and the life of everyone around them that they knew that they were worthy of death. You know, the, the, the lady who was the adulteress who was caught, he said, you know, where are your accusers? After he had pricked all their conscience and made them go away, she thought she was going to die, and rightfully so. She thought she was judged and he was going to execute the judgment. He forgave her, and she loved much because she'd been forgiven much. She judged herself, and I think that is Mary who poured out her love offering, the alabaster box, wept, uh, wiped his feet with her tears, and he said, she does this for my death, for my burial, which means she had a revelation before everybody else, the significance of his death. Why? Because she was in a position where she had judged her flesh, and that's the position of being in the Holy of Holies, unveiled, really seeing Christ shining for who he really is and what he's accomplishing, and understanding it. The light comes when we judge our flesh. Revelation comes when we judge our flesh. So this is, I guess, the, again, being conformed to the death of Christ is a goal, but it is not a mystical experience. It is just a cumulative understanding of God's judgment on the flesh from the word. And we agree with it before we really understand it. And then we give him, ask him to give us, you know, light so we can understand and agree with him. And it doesn't hurt to judge your flesh. It's actually liberating because you're embarrassed that you did that thing because you still have hope in your flesh. When I, sometimes I remember shameful and embarrassing things I did in the past and my whole conscience and my soul goes, oh, woe is me. And I even start saying, oh Lord, I'm sorry. Even if it was years ago, it'll come to memory. I've learned that the answer to that plaguing, shame, embarrassment, and humiliation is I'm crucified with Christ. That's God's judgment on that. It's all gone. It's terminated. He's not expecting anything different. He already knew what it was. And there's a new creation in the spirit. And I don't know who that guy is. I know he's, he's like Jesus. And, and I know that the way that works is by me learning who Jesus is and beholding him. And learning to enjoy him and drink and eat him from the word and abide in him. And something starts to flow out. And you shouldn't be ministering, so-called, if you don't have any clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, I, just, I and I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to condemn anybody who's got a channel, but what I'm saying is we want to serve in the spirit. We died to the law and we were joined in the body of Christ and we we're joined to him who, who's raised from the dead that we might bear fruit to God so that we may serve not in the oldness of letter, but the newness of the spirit. Do you know what that means to serve in the newness of the spirit? Do we know anything about the spirit? He seek, he, God is spirit. And he seeks those who worship him in spirit and in truth. And we're to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and we're to walk according to the spirit. I'm not going to listen to anybody who doesn't know how to walk according to the spirit. You know, what does that mean? to walk according to the Spirit. If you have no idea, then you're not ready to be teaching. 
you're just going to teach Bible knowledge. You're not going to teach Christ. What does it mean to have the mindset on the things of the Spirit? And I've taught about that on this channel, you know, that it has to do with the spirit of sonship. If you read Romans 8, which is how we get free from the dilemma of Romans 7 and where we really practical, practically see the death of Christ worked out in our members where by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of our body, that's all in Romans 8. And what it leads up to is those who are led of the Spirit of God are the children of God, for you've not received a spirit of bondage again into fear, but a spirit of sonship in which you cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and heirs, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, heirs of God. The Spirit is all about unfolding who Christ is and what our inheritance is and what is our position as sons and what is true of us in Christ, including the fact that we are dead. You know, We were judged. Adam was judged. The old creation is done. God's not looking at it. God's not expecting from it anything from it. And I learned to walk according to the Spirit as I learned to agree with God's judgment and see with his perspective and stop expecting from my flesh and start depending on Christ. And not only that, but start agreeing with all the good things that God says about me in Christ until it sets me free from all the condemnation. You can't minister grace until you know how to be set free from condemnation. And that has everything to do with being renewed in the spirit of your mind, setting your mind on the things of the spirit, walking according to the spirit. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak because of sinful flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of the flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in his flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We need to learn to walk according to the Spirit. And that's not hard. It's not mystical like the Charismatics would have you think. It's not a mystical experience. It's an agreement with truth. It's a believing with the truth and saying amen to the truth until you're so renewed with the truth that it actually made you happy on the inside. And then from that joy that you have, because Christ is your life and you actually see it and you see that there's no judgment, there's no obstacle. You can come boldly to the throne of grace no matter what you've done or no matter who you are and you've got access to him right now and you know how to stand in that grace for yourself. Then you can start telling other people about the comforts you've received from that position and that's ministry. Not just telling people factoids about the Bible. I could teach on dispensationalism and never talk about Christ. I could talk about the Nephilim and never talk about Christ. It's all Bible, but to serve in the newness of the Spirit means dispensing Christ as food and drink, which means I've got to be eating and drinking Him. So I strongly recommend to be patient. You know, seek to know what the Bible says about the Spirit and your death with Christ and his judgment and how God looks at things. Learn the way God sees and learn to agree with him. That's how you're going to be conformed to him and patterned after him and imitate him, if you want to call it that, and minister from a position of grace. You've got to agree with God's judgments. Most, a lot of, so many people right now are just, are, their whole channel and ministry is just about arguing with God's judgments. <laughs> so there's no ministry there. There's no food there. If you hear somebody giving you grace to where you know that Jesus is real in your life after they're done talking, that's a person who knows how to walk in the Spirit and knows how to minister from the Spirit and knows the things of the Spirit and has judged the flesh. There's no other way. You know, um, so this was kind of a random ramble, but I it, it actually I didn't end up saying what I thought I was going to say, but I'm going to go ahead and upload it anyway. Sorry about the time, a little tired, long night. Take care.